Welcome to Season 4, Episode 17 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be talking with physician, psychologist, and author Leonard Sachs about the unique crisis that boys are facing in our school and the crisis that girls are facing and what teachers need to know about supporting them both. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. So my guest this week is Leonard Sachs. He is board certified in family medicine, and he currently practices in suburban Philadelphia. He also has a PhD in psychology. I was introduced to Leonard's work when I heard him on NPR, and I was just fascinated by his insights about how schools are failing boys. He brought up points that I had just never considered before. And he mentioned that it's very common for teachers to not understand the research and not understand how schools have changed over time and how it's been very difficult for many boys to adjust in the process. And I just thought immediately, I have got to invite him to be a guest on Truth For Teachers so that he can speak directly to us. And I was just thrilled when he agreed to be a guest on the show. So Leonard's here today, and um, I'm just so excited to let you listen on in this interview and hear his insights. Leonard, initially, I wanted to invite you on the show to talk about boys. So let's start there. You wrote a really powerful book called Boys Adrift, The Five Factors Driving the Growing Epidemic of Unmotivated Boys and Underachieving Young Men. And I think any teacher will understand immediately what it is that you're referring to. Disengagement, particularly with boys, is a huge issue that most of us have encountered. What do teachers need to understand about how our boys are impacted by the way that we do school? Well, one of the points I tried to make in the book is that there have been some really profound changes in the way American education works over the last 30 years or so. I've been a medical doctor now for more than 30 years. And, you know, I grew up, I attended public schools in northern Ohio. And back then in the 1970s, uh, the boys uh, typically won most of the awards and were editor of the school newspaper and edited the poetry journal and uh, edited this uh, yearbook and all that kind of stuff. So then I'm, I'm practicing in Maryland. It's the early 90s. And I notice that the girls are the great majority of the uh, uh, honor students and uh, editing the school newspaper and editing the poetry journal. I was wondering, you know, what is it about Maryland that the boys here don't seem to be doing very well? And throughout the 1990s, I began to look into this and reached out to colonies, uh, colleagues, reached out to colleagues across the United States and um, discovered that this was not confined to suburban Maryland, that this was true across the United States, that in roughly 20 years time from the mid 70s to mid 90s there had been a change and since that time that change has actually accelerated there's some good recent uh, work that i cite in the updated edition that shows that this gender gap in achievement is widening and it's widening not so much because girls are doing better they're not you look for example at who's reading for fun in their spare time looking over the last 30 years girls today are a little less likely to read for fun in their spare time than, than girls were 30 years ago. But American boys have stopped reading altogether. Uh, the, so the gender gap has widened very dramatically on that parameter, for example, who's reading for fun in their spare time. Not because girls are reading more, they're not, but because boys are reading much, much less. So one of the things I tried to answer in the book and in the revised edition, which just came out, is why? What happened? Why are boys today so much less likely than their sisters in the same demographic in the same household uh, to be top students, to be high achievers? And a bunch of things happened. Uh, but one was the change in, in the way we conduct American education. Uh, so, for example, as I said, I grew up in northern Ohio. And uh, during the winter months, uh, we used to put on our Uh, winter coats and go outside throw snowballs at each other and the teachers would come out and join us Uh, students against teachers I remember Mr. Albers was a great shot he'd get right between the eyes every time kids still want to throw snowballs but today if uh, two boys go out on the school blacktop and start throwing snowballs at each other 
a teacher is going to come running out and say, what are you guys doing? You're not allowed to do that here. No, to throw snowballs at each other. Boys doing things that boys have always done, whether it's throwing snowballs at each other or pointing fingers at each other saying, bang, bang, you're dead, or drawing a picture of a, a knight chopping a dragon's head off. Things that boys have always done now get you in trouble. School has become unfriendly to boys. And that was not because of any war against boys. There was never any intention on anyone's part to disengage boys. It was the unintended consequence. So a lot of what I try to do in the book is to call attention to these unconscious ways that school has changed in ways that have the unintended consequence of disengaging boys and what schools can do to make schools more friendly to boys without making them unfriendly to girls. So many good thoughts there. What, how, how would you recommend that a teacher respond when something like that were to happen? Okay, so specifically with regard to uh, throwing snowballs, uh, I learned this many, many years ago at uh, St. Andrews, which is a private school just north of Toronto. They have a very simple rule at St. Andrews. Inbounds and out of bounds. If you want to throw snowballs, go to the football field. The football field is on school property, but it's not on the way to anything else. So you're not inconveniencing anyone who doesn't want throw balls, s- snowballs thrown at them by telling them don't go to the football field during the winter months uh, because that's not on the way to anything else. But if you want to throw snowballs at your friend, you and your friend go out to the football field and there you may throw snwballs at one another it's, it's the throwing of snowballs as inbounds on the football field and out of bounds everywhere else on campus and you know i've worked i've visited now more than 400 schools over the last 15 years and at my recommendation we've deployed this strategy at some american schools and a few of those schools have required that parents sign a consent form before kids are allowed to go to the football field or whatever the designated place is and i don't have a problem with that i mean i understand liability That's what's driving this change. Schools are concerned about getting sued. And and I respect that. I'm a medical doctor. I understand liability concerns. Uh, School has to do whatever they have to do to protect themselves from liability. But don't criminalize being a boy. Don't make being a boy and doing things that boys have always done a cause for discipline referral. Make an accommodation so that boys can do the things that boys have always done without having to leave the school. Because the unintended message when you say, hey, you're not allowed to do that here, go somewhere else. The unintended message that boys get is school is not the place for boys. If you want to be a boy, leave the school. And that's the message a lot of boys are getting loud and clear, and they're leaving the school, whether it's to throw snowballs or to play Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto, make the school a boy-friendly place. You can have a snowball-throwing tournament, something uh, some other schools have done at my recommendation, and uh, say, hey, after school, we're going to have a throw, snowball-throwing tournament. Anybody's welcome. It's going to be a round-robin term- tournament. You get uh, three chances to hit the target, and it's going to be... This student versus that student, we're going to go through every student's going to, and we're going to have a round robin and, and whoever will have one grand champion. Uh, and when you do that, we find that about 80% of the kids who sign up will be boys and about 20% will be girls. Some girls really like to throw snowballs. Many boys don't like to throw snowballs. Gender is complicated, but you can accommodate these differences if you understand the differences. Right. And that, that just sends such a different message to boys about um, about what we value from them. So I, I think that's such a great point. And clearly, we have a lot of things that we need to be more mindful of with our boys. Yeah. And, you know, schools pay a lot of lip service to the idea that we respect diversity and we want and we celebrate everybody's differences. But in reality, they don't respect diversity. Uh, they only respect a certain kind of diversity. Uh, but boys who want to throw snowballs or boys who want to write stories about Roman gladiators uh, soon find out that their diversity is not at all welcome and no one's interested in hearing their voice. And again, boys get that message and they're like, okay, fine. I don't care about your stupid English either. I'm going to go home and play video games. That's right. Yep, that's exactly what happens. So what about our female students? After you wrote Boys Adrift, you wrote a book called Girls on the Edge, Four Factors Driving the New Crisis for Girls. And in this book, you addressed how many young girls seem confident and strong on the outside, 
but they're very fragile within. And they, they seem to be doing okay in school, but there are a lot of deeper issues at play that we might not recognize because they seem to be performing well in school. What can teachers do to support girls in our classrooms? Well, again, uh, it needs to be about more than just the performance. And if you're a teacher, uh, when I meet with teachers, I say, you need to communicate. I'm interested in what's in hearing what's going on in your life. If you care to confide in me, I'm here for you. Uh, because what you'll find is a lot of girls have a lot of anxiety simmering just beneath the surface. And that also is a big change. Uh, girls today are about 400, 400%, four times more likely to be anxious compared with girls in the same demographic just 30 years ago. The anxious teenage girl who's obsessed, who's having trouble getting to sleep at night, is now very common and was not common 30 years ago. Uh, and one reason for that that I explore both in my book, Girls on the Edge, and more, and more recently in my book called The Collapse of Parenting, is that there's been a change in the culture that kids live in, a change from a culture in which parents' opinions were the most important to the culture of today, in which the opinion of same-age peers are most important. And that change has put a lot of girls at risk because for many American girls today, what matters more than anything else is having lots of followers on Instagram, having lots of kids like like your photo that you posted on Snapchat or Instagram. That's right. They're basing yeah. their, enti their entire identity is based on likes and followers and, and comments, and that's how they're getting right. validated. Yes. Right. And as... Uh, Relations with same-age peers are always going to be contingent and ephemeral. Every girl knows uh, a girl who was the most popular girl, went from being the most popular girl to being the odd girl out in one day, in five minutes. And so she's frantically checking her phone because, God forbid, somebody sent you a text message and you don't promptly respond. Uh, the other girl might think you're ignoring her or you don't like her, and boom, uh, so these girls are just frantic. If, if the teacher takes their phone away, they will literally have a meltdown uh, because, oh my goodness, uh, if my friend thinks I have my phone and I'm not answering, she's going to think I'm being mean to her. And, and that's the worst thing in the world. Uh, so I encourage parents and teachers to work together to turn off the screens, uh, to... Uh, encourage face-to-face -face time. When I meet with parents, I talk about no screens at the dinner table. Um, Amanda Ripley has a wonderful book called The Smartest Kids in the World. And one of the questions she addresses is, why has there been such a collapse in American academic achievement relative to uh, kids in other countries? In just a very short time, just since the year 2000, we used to be way above Poland in the year 2000, but by the year 2012, Poland was way ahead of us even though we spend three times as much per capita. And one of the explanations Amanda Ripley believes is that in those 12 years, between 2000 and 2012, American schools brought screens into the classroom in a big way. And the, the screens have the unintended consequence of undermining social skills and uh, undermining academic skills. Um, and I think there are many good arguments to be made against technology in the classroom. Uh, but specifically regarding girls, we need to get kids to turn off the screens and engage one another face to face. Yeah, I, I agree. Is there anything else that teachers can do to support girls in our classrooms? Well, the, the point I'm always making when I meet with teachers is that you must create the teacher student connection uh, that the girl has to know that you really care about her as an individual. And again, a lot of teachers pay lip service to that. But what that means is if that girl wants to come up to you and talk to you about her parents' divorce, you need to sit down and listen. You're not a counselor, you're a classroom teacher, but she wants to talk to you and you need to show I'm really interested. I mean, you may not have anything to offer, but she's looking for a grown-up to talk to and she's chosen you. And if you communicate that I am here for you and I I want to hear what's going on. Then she will work harder in your algebra class, not because she suddenly suddenly likes algebra, but because she doesn't want to disappoint you. She doesn't want to let you down. 
Yeah, these relationships, you know, I'm, I'm, that's, you know, it's a good callback to what you were saying. The same thing about boys is we've got to validate who these kids are in our classrooms, the things that they are bringing to the classroom and, and really honor that, honor who they are. I think that's right. So when I think about these different gender issues, um, that seems to be something that's coming to the forefront more and more. Your very first book was called Why Gender Matters, What Parents and Teachers Need to Know About the Emerging Science of Sex Differences. Um, and you published that 10 years ago. I believe you're working on an update to the book now. What do teachers need to understand about gender in today's schools? Well, there's so much. And uh, indeed, Penguin Random House has invited me to revise the book, and the new edition will come out next year, and there's a lot in there. Uh, but in, in almost every content area, we now have good research showing that the best way to engage the average girl is really profoundly different from the best way to engage the average boy. For example, you're teaching equations and multiple variables, middle school algebra. It turns out the best way to engage the average boy, not the talented boy necessarily, but just the average boy, is to say x plus 2y equals 60, 2x plus y equals 90, here's how we solve for x and y. And that actually really engages most boys who are interested in abstract numbers and the characteristics of abstract numbers for the sake of numbers. This is true not only of the talented boy, but of the average boy. It is emphatically not true of the average girl who will say, this is like totally irrelevant to like everything. Why should any normal person care about this? And the result of teachers don't have this awareness is that the the girl comes to regard math as boring. Um, so it turns out the best way to engage the average girl in that same content is to say, hey, I've got a coupon from the local department store. It says this week only they're offering, I can get two blouses and a sweater for 60 bucks or two sweaters and a blouse for 90 bucks. How much are they really charging for each blouse and each sweater? And each girl, including the girl who hates to shop, is engaged because even that girl who hates to shop and many girls hate to shop uh, even that girl who hates to shop knows girls who like to shop and can see how the question is relevant to the real world so the average girl it's essential to tie algebra and number theory into the concrete into the into the real world for the average boy that is not only not true it can actually disengage the word problem can be the hardest part of the unit for the average boy. And by beginning the unit with the word problem, you're losing the boy. So you need to differentiate, you need to customize what you're doing in the classroom in order to reach every girl and every boy. What's something that you wish every teacher knew about gender in order to better help our students? Well, what I think every teacher understood is that there is not just one way to teach the content. There's always more than one way to teach the content. And uh, the way that works best for most girls may not work best for both boys and vice versa. If you don't understand that, you end up reinforcing gender stereotypes. You end up with boys who think creative writing and poetry is for girls. And you think girls who think computer coding and physics is for boys. If you understand the differences, then you can break down the gender stereotypes very easily. And the same girl who loves fashion design will love computer coding. And the same girl and the same boy who loves uh, American football and uh, video games like Call of Duty will love Jane Eyre and Emily Dickinson. I've seen this. Uh, it's not that difficult. It just requires a little awareness uh, of what the differences are. Can you point teachers towards some resources um, where they can learn more about these things? It could be your resources or, or other websites and books that you find helpful for this. Sure. Well, I hope teachers will take a look at uh, my books, Boys Adrift uh, and Girls on the Edge and the new edition of Why Gender Matters. I also am a big fan uh, of Abigail James and her books, Teaching the Male Brain, Teaching the Female Brain. Abigail and I have shared a podium on many occasions, and we have uh, many similar uh, perspectives on these issues. It's fantastic. Thank you. 
So I always close out the show with something that I call a takeaway truth. And it's just this short but powerful sentence or quote that I want teachers to remember in the week ahead. Do you have a takeaway truth that you can leave us with this week? Sure. Uh, the big differences between girls and boys are not in, not in what they can do, but in what they want to do. The big differences between girls and boys are not in ability but in motivation. Again, 30 years ago, people used to say girls had better verbal ability, boys have better spatial ability. That turns out not to be true. There are very little differences between what girls and boys can do, but there are big differences in girls and boys and what they want to do. If you understand those differences, then you can break down the gender stereotypes as you construct uh, strategies to engage and motivate every girl and every boy. Fantastic. Thank you again, Leonard, for being here. And thanks to all of you for listening. Have a great week. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Truth for Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's edupodcastnetwork.com.